Good morning, everybody, and let's get started with the ANSYS Virtual Academy. For today's topic, we're going to be covering the basics of heat transfer modeling uses, using ANSYS Fluent. I'm your host today. My name is John Dow. I'm a senior applications engineer uh, focused on the structure side. And my colleague, Snigda, will be performing the uh, demonstrations and explanations today. Snigda, would you like to take it away? Thank you so much, JD. Thank you for the warm introduction. Good morning, everybody. My name is Nikta Sarkar. I am the CFT application engineer here at Kativ Technologies. And I'm very excited to you know, share with you some of the basic, most frequently used ANSYS capabilities for thermal modeling today. Um, so stay tuned for that. Another thing that I wanted to mention in today's session is that thermal modeling is a vast field. Um, depending on the application that you're using it for. It could get really complex. There could be additional physics to take care of. Um, so I will not be able to cover the entire length and breadth uh, of thermal modeling, but uh, this session is just a beginner's introduction course to set up simple heat transfer problems in ANSYS Fluent because simple heat transfer problems are commonly encountered in all engineering applications, I would say. So um, yeah, hopefully this is gonna be useful for you. Um, and um, please stay tuned for another upcoming following session that'll talk about the concepts in a more advanced manner. So with that said, let's jump right in and begin today's presentation. So for today's agenda, we will firstly be covering the basics and the general overview of the different modes of heat transfer, namely conduction, convection, and radiation. Uh, this is just a preamble to understand how we will be setting up our thermal modeling problems in ANSYS Fluent. And the second part um, of the AVA session today, we'll be covering demonstrations with different examples that will show you how to set up the boundary conditions for these heat transfer problems. And uh, towards the latter half, I'll be talking about how we can post-process some of these heat transfer quantities or results that we might be interested in uh, using the ANSYS Fluent GUI. Now let's begin with the modes of heat transfer. Everybody knows that the three main uh, modes of heat transfer are conduction, convection, and radiation. Conduction often takes place through direct contact um, of molecules with each other in any given medium, whether it, whether it be a solid medium or a fluid medium. Um, convection takes place through um, the movement of bulk fluid, um, fluid that carries heat with it. And radiation, of course, takes place through the emission of energy via electromagnetic waves, right? It doesn't really um, heat up the medium in between, but depending on the surface temperature and the surface properties, um, you'll have a certain intensity of radiation. There's also phase change, for example, condensation and evaporation, wherein heat transfer can take place through the transfer of latent heat or vaporization. But uh, again, you know, that is um, coupled with the multi-phase um, physics, so we will not be covering it today, which is why it is grayed out. Um, but we will be touching um, on conduction and convection and talk about radiation briefly. In the picture on the right, you can see a very simple example. Um, one of the most commonly seen um, images, you know, I think this one was issued by NASA um, about how we can differentiate between these three modes of heat transfer. Um, you can see that the handle of the metal pan heats up because of conduction, uh, wherein, you know, energy from higher um, kinetic energy molecules is being transferred to uh, lower kinetic energy molecules and um, all the uh, molecules in contact are transferring heat. The convection is um, uh, depicted using the convection currents that we see in the fluid being heated. Uh, the heated fluid at the bottom, uh, of course, you know, has a lower density as it gets heated. So it rises on the top and pushes the colder, more denser fluid down. Uh, the radiation, of course, you know, is an important consideration for high temperature applications. For example, you know, the heat from the burner is directly being radiated um, to all the surfaces that are in the vicinity um, of the heat source. 
Now let's dive a little bit deeper into conduction itself. Um, as I mentioned earlier, conduction takes place through direct contact. Uh, basically, a higher energy particle will have a higher velocity. So you see a lot of vibrations and collisions uh, within the particles of a medium. And that's how heat transfer takes place from one region to another. Um, conduction is usually defined by the Fourier's law of thermal conduction, which states that the rate of heat transfer is proportional to the temperature gradient and to the area. Um, on the right over here, you can see an equation that um, depicts exactly that, um, wherein Q is your energy um, and A is your um, area of heat transfer. Uh, small Q is basically the flux. K is the thermal conductivity. It may or may not be constant, depending on your application. And T, of course, is the temperature. If we were to reduce this equation to a 1D problem, wherein temperature was only varying in one direction, as depicted at the, in the bottom picture, uh, where temperature is only varying along this thickness, um, then we could basically reduce this equation uh, to T hot minus T cold is equal to um, R into Q, where R is the thermal resistance and can be given by this thickness divided by the conductivity multiplied by the area. Uh, now keep in mind that this area is basically um, the area that is normal to the direction of the heat transfer. Now let's move on to convection. Um, we know that the two main modes of convection are natural convection and force convection. Natural convection takes place due to buoyancy forces when gravity is taken into account. For example, in a pan, you know, if fluid is being heated, uh, the fluid at the very bottom of the pan, which is closer to the heat source, um, will expand in volume and become less dense. As a result, it rises on the top and pushes the colder, denser fluid down. Uh, this results in the um, uh, presence of natural convection currents, uh, which is what you see in most of these um, cases. There could also be forced convection, wherein you are forcing the fluid to move because of the presence of an external um, influence, such as a fan or a pump. Um, that would induce artificial currents. Uh, now, how do we uh, define convection or how do we define the rate of heat transfer? Well, you can base it on the Newton's law of cooling, which basically states that the rate of heat loss of a body is proportional to the difference in the temperatures between the body and the surroundings. So H over here in this equation is the average heat transfer coefficient. T body is the body of, is the temperature of the body in question. And T infinity is the ambient temperature. You can look at the units as well. Now this average heat transfer coefficient, it's not constant. It depends on a lot of factors and it varies with temperature as well. Um, one of the key uh, important parameters that uh, is of interest when we're doing conduction convection problems uh, is fig figuring out an accurate heat transfer coefficient in our fluent problems uh, that might be an input or an output um, depending on the application that we're studying. Lastly, let's talk about radiation a little bit. Um, as I mentioned before, the intensity of radiation depends on the temperature of the body and the nature of its surface. Uh, we know that you know all bodies above the absolute temperature of zero Kelvin emit some sort of radiation uh, due to the particle due to the motion of the um, microscopic particles. And uh, radiation should be taken into account when you are studying high temperature applications, when the heat transfer through radiation is much higher compared to conduction and convection. Um, those are the cases in which radiation definitely needs to be accounted for. Um, based on the Stefan Boltzmann law, we know that the radiation energy is proportional to the fourth power of absolute temperature of a body. Uh, for a black body, you know, you'll have the highest possible heat transfer rate. Um, for a gray body or a real body, uh, you know, you can usually rely on the, um, you know, expression on the right to figure out what kind of net heat transfer you're getting. Um, the body will be emitting some radiation and it'll also be absorbing some radiation from the nearby surfaces. The net heat transfer will be the difference between the energy emitted and the energy absorbed, uh, which is essentially um, what is displayed over here, uh, where 
um, epsilon is the emissivity, sigma is the Stefan Boltzmann constant with a value as displayed on the slide, and um, AS is the surface area through which the emission is taking place. Um, TW is the temperature of the body and T infinity is the surrounding temperature. Now, when we're doing a thermal problem, whether it be uh, related to flow or whether it be a simple case wherein there's just only conduction and no flow is present in the domain, uh, what are some of the important quantities or the results that uh, we as engineers are interested in? Uh, we are usually interested in the temperature distribution. Uh, we are interested in heat flux rates. We are definitely interested in um, accurately obtaining the heat transfer coefficients uh, instead of having to assume them based on empirical relations. Uh, if you're doing thermal management, then you might want to assess the failure modes. Uh, maybe a material is getting overheated, um, goes past its temperature limit. Uh, maybe you want to identify localized heat spots uh, to improve your design to, you know, provide better um, heat transfer um, uh, rates in those locations. You might also vary the different conductivities based on the material that you choose, um, and that could be an important design consideration as well. Also, one of the most important, uh, you know, up and coming applications is to do uh, multi-physics simulations where you're coupling conjugate heat transfer with FEA analysis to study thermally induced stresses. Now, uh, before I proceed, I want to um, make sure that everybody understands what I mean by conjugate heat transfer. Um, it is a you know, term that we uh, loosely throw around in the CFD world, but if somebody is beginning with CFD and is unfamiliar with the term, uh, I just want to explain it for a little bit. Um, when you are understanding what kind of heat transfer you are expected to see in your problem. Oftentimes, you know, you will use empirical correlations, you'll use the Nusselt number or the Prandtl number uh, to come up with, you know, heat transfer coefficients for your problem. Uh, those are simpler to assume uh, based on, you know, uh, a laminar flow or, you know, in cases where you already have established uh, empirical um, expressions. But for most of the cases, those don't give you an accurate uh, non-uniform heat transfer coefficient for your domain. That's where conjugate heat transfer comes into play, wherein CFT basically allows you to model both the solid and the fluid domains together and simultaneously solve for the fluid flow and the associated heat transfer that you're expecting to see with the fluid in the domain. So I will be, you know, um, elaborating on this term and what is the difference between assuming a heat transfer coefficient and actually modeling the fluid flow in your uh, CFD domain um, in an example that we study in a bit. Now, when you're setting up um, a fluid problem with thermal boundary conditions, uh, one of the most important considerations is the wall boundary condition, right? Uh, of course, you have to specify a temperature at the inlet and outlet. You might even want to specify a heat flux. But for the wall, um, what are the main thermal conditions that are available to you? What I've done here is I've grabbed a screenshot from Fluent GUI itself. And of course, I'll be talking about it during the demonstration. But here you can see the different options available to you under the thermal tab for any of your wall boundary conditions. You can specify a heat flux, you can specify a temperature, you can specify a convection or a radiation boundary condition, you can specify a mixed boundary condition, and for doing multi-physics um, simulations, you can also choose system coupling. In this example, or you know, in the demonstrations that we're going to be covering today, we will talk about heat flux, we'll talk about convection, and we'll briefly talk about radiation. Um, the system coupling boundary condition, we will uh, explore that in a future ABA session when we talk about uh, multi-physics simulations. Um, now, each of these different boundary conditions have their different settings. Um, they're pretty intuitive uh, for anybody, you know, who has experience with some theory in thermal modeling. If you're only doing a convection problem with a certain conductivity in your solid zone, you could choose the convection boundary condition. 
If you're only going to specify a heat flux on your wall, you could go ahead and choose the heat flux option. If you were to do a radiation case, you could go ahead and choose the radiation problem. And the mixed boundary condition lets you do both convection and radiation. So I'll be talking about these individual options when we start with the demonstration. The other thing that I wanted to talk about before I go into the demonstration is how we can model heat transfer in walls. Uh, what are the simplifications that are available to us using ANSYS Fluent that will help our job become a little bit simpler? Now, one of the things that we can do is obviously model the solid zone and the fluid zone separately. What I mean by that is, for example, you have a pan and you have a fluid uh, which is getting heated. Now, you could simply choose to model the wall um, of the pan, uh, including the thickness of the pan. So, for example, if the thickness of the pan is around five millimeters, you go ahead and model the entire five millimeters in your pre-processing stage. That would give you the most accurate um, and the most reasonable uh, CFT solution that you can get, right? Because not only are you gonna be modeling the fluid domain, you're also gonna be capturing the conduction in all directions, both in the planar and the normal directions accurately. However, if you want to reduce your computational domain and not have so many cells um, and this becomes very important in more complex, more complicated geometries, then instead of modeling the solid zone, what you can do is simply assign a thickness to the wall. So instead of actually capturing the thickness of five millimeters in your pre-processing stage, you just make it a simple wall with no thickness, but inside fluent, you can assign a value to the supposed thickness of this wall. What that would do is it would let you model the heat transfer in the normal direction. Now, of course, this is not as accurate as the first step. Why? Because in this case, when you're assigning a wall thickness, the heat transfer is only taking place in the normal direction and not in the planar directions. But for some of the cases, this could be a simplistic assumption that works well uh, for your certain application. And the third option is to use something called shell conduction. Now, shell conduction is a very um, efficient way of reducing your computational domain and making your simulations run faster. What it basically does is it allows you to add virtual cell layers in your fluent model without actually having to model it. The difference between step two and step three is that where assigning a thickness will only let you model heat transfer in the normal direction. Uh, if you use shell conduction, you will be able to model the heat transfer in both normal and in planar directions. So I will be talking about this briefly as well in the demonstration. So with that said, uh, let us look at the problems that we will be doing for the demonstration in today's AVA session. Uh, the first problem is one of the most simple uh, heat transfer problems that you can actually set up in Fluent. You basically have an annular duct and water is flowing at room temperature uh, from one side to another. So one of the sides is an inlet and the other one is the outlet. And then there is a copper coil in between uh, which gets heated and adds a certain amount of energy to the flow domain. How much energy? Three megawatts. Now, what we want to see is that because we're adding this heat source in this copper coil, how does that affect the temperature of the fluid surrounding it? Does the water get heated because of the heat transfer from the coil to the water? And what kind of temperature distribution can we see in the wall itself? What kind of temperature distribution do we see at the outlet? So this is one of the most simple problems that we can set up, but a good foundation for anybody who's looking to get started with thermal analysis. The second problem that we will be talking about is that of a heat source and a heat sink. You have an electric component right at the bottom, um, which will supply this entire um, heat sink with 1.5 watts of power. And then you have a copper plate in between. And then finally, you have the aluminum heat sinks, right? Now these pin fins um, will act as a heat sink. And we will do two cases. In one case, we will assign an assumed heat transfer coefficient to model the heat transfer through the solid. And in the second case, we'll actually be modeling a fluid domain around it 
to elaborate the difference between doing conjugate heat transfer and assuming a heat transfer coefficient based on empirical results. Right. With that said, let's get started with the demonstration. So I'll go ahead and share my Fluent GUI. Um, JD, can you see my Fluent screen? Yes, I can. Thank you, thank you. So um, what we have here is the first demonstration case where you basically have the annular duct and the heated copper coil uh, right in the middle. So let me go ahead and display it. So this is a translucent version so you can see um, how the geometry looks. I will also go ahead and turn on the inlets and the outlets so that um, you know how the flow is traveling. Right. And um, because, you know, it would have taken a lot of time to actually set up everything from scratch and cover three different examples uh, for our demonstration. I am using solved cases for the demonstration today. But if you have any questions about the pre-processing stage or the setup stage, uh, feel free to leave those questions in the Q&A box. And, you know, I will um, either take them on later today or maybe I can circle back to those questions uh, during the coming week and reach out to you. So this is the first case, like I said. Um, let's start from the very beginning. Now, in order to do any sort of thermal study um, in Fluent, the first thing that you need to make sure is that the energy equation should be turned on. This is an energy equation that is solved along with the Navier-Stokes um, and the continuity equation uh, while solving. If you were to turn it off, then you wouldn't really be able to account for heat transfer of temperatures. Um, it's not always necessary uh, to uh, be interested in heat transfer quantities for turning on the energy equation. Sometimes you would have to turn on the energy equation even to, you know, introduce a compressible gas in your uh, fluid domain. So depending on the application that you're studying, um, it may or may not be vital for you to turn this on. Since we're doing a thermal study, this definitely needs to be on. Um, I'm choosing an SSTK Omega turbulence model in this case. Um, whether or not a flow is laminar or turbulent, uh, especially in the case of um, heat transfer is determined by the Rayleigh number. Um, and I'm sure, you know, if you want to study a little bit more about the theory, um, I can send you or share some information with you um, to that measure. But in this case, you know, I am just assuming um, a turbulence model uh, arbitrarily because um, the idea is to demonstrate the heat transfer capabilities and not so much on the accuracy of the solution. So feel free to choose um, whatever suits your case. The next thing that we need to be um, sure about is the material that we choose for our heat transfer modeling the material would determine what kind of conductivity you are assigning uh, for heat transfer to take place. Uh, since in this model, water is entering from the inlet and exiting out of the outlet, for the fluid domain, we definitely go ahead and choose the water. And you will notice that, you know, it has some inbuilt thermal conductivity to it. If you wanted to vary it with temperature, uh, you could always, you know, um, uh, go to edit and then have different options uh, available to you. You could use a polynomial expression, even a UDF to define um, an anisotropic thermal conductivity. For this simple case, I'm just using a constant conductivity and then closing the dialog box. Um, now this problem has both a fluid domain and a solid domain. The solid domain being the coil itself. Um, as I mentioned in the problem description, it was made out of copper. So we would have to add the material copper from the Fluent database, or you could choose any other material for which you know the properties and make a custom material within the GUI. So as you can see with the solid zone, it has a good conductivity um, based on the uh, 
properties of copper. And again, this is a constant in this case. I'm gonna go ahead and close it. So let me do this. Let me just display the fluid zone. So this blip that you see is basically the coil that has been subtracted from the overall fluid domain. The rest of the fluid domain is depicted here. If I were to just look at the solid domain, then that would be the coil. So this is the copper coil that we're talking about. Now I'm gonna go ahead and click on this solid domain. Why? Because if you remember in the problem description, I said that you know I'm assigning it a certain um, value of uh, heat source. This heat source is being produced in the coil, right? How do I introduce that to a domain? How do I introduce that in a domain? I go ahead and check source terms. Once I do that, this tab becomes active. I select it and then I click on edit. And then you can see that I have uh, basically specified the volumetric um, heat source. Um, I think the value was three, megaw three megawatts, if I'm not wrong. Uh, what I basically do is I divide that by the total volume of the solid zone, and that'll um, allow me to specify a volumetric heat source. When I eventually look at convert solution, <clears throat> I should be able to tally my um, overall heat source with the problem description that we saw earlier. So that is done. Now, once we have um, figured out the cell zone conditions, let's go to the boundary conditions. So we saw the inlet a little bit earlier. That has been assigned as a velocity inlet from which water is entering. We have a velocity of 0.4 meter per second and a temperature boundary condition of you know, normal room temperature. Right. And at the outlet, we have a pressure outlet and we have zero gauge pressure at the outlet, and then there's a backflow temperature as well. Now, most importantly, we specified the heat source in the cell zone condition. Now let us look at the wall boundary condition because that is of a huge importance when you're setting up a thermal model. Now notice one thing, you will see that along with the different walls, you have something called a shadow wall. Now, what is that shadow wall? Um, whenever you are working with a thermal model, you need to ensure that your mesh is conformal. What that means is that the solid domain and the fluid domain should be talking to each other. The node points at the boundary between the solid and the fluid should be coincident, right? So in this case, right from the pre-processing stage, we ensured that all the nodes on the outside boundary of this fin also um, correspond to the node points on the fluid side. However, there might be complicated geometries in which you're assembling the mesh from different regions. And when you have the final mesh, um, there could be a completely different mesh for the fluid zone and a completely different mesh for the solid zone. What do we do in that case? We need to make sure that those nodes are mapped uh, with each other. In that case, we can go ahead and create something called a mesh interface. In this particular problem setup, I don't need to worry about it uh, because right from the pre-processing stage, uh, my mesh was conformal. I will be covering how to create mesh interfaces in the second AVA session that I have planned. But for today's demonstration, I'm working with all examples where the mesh is already conformal. Now, when the mesh is conformal, at the outer walls of this coil, you will notice that the node points are being shared both by the solid domain and the fluid domain. That means at this outer surface, you have an adjacent solid zone and a fluid zone, which is why there is an automatic creation of a shadow wall. So if I go ahead and click on the coil wall, so first of all, let me display this for you. So when I display this, you can see that this is the coil. Now, if I display the shadow wall, you will notice that it's the same thing. The reason is that one of these walls is facing the solid side and one of these walls is facing the fluid side, but they're essentially the same walls. That means whatever boundary condition that I assign to the coil side will also get assigned to the shadow coil side. So I'll go ahead and click on this 
When I click on this, I will go to the thermal condition and I will notice that it is automatically coupled. Anytime you have a shadow wall, you should expect the wall to be automatically coupled. Coupled meaning that it is one side is adjacent to the fluid domain, the other side is adjacent to the solid domain. Now, it doesn't necessarily have to be a fluid solid boundary. It could also be a solid solid boundary or a fluid fluid boundary. So coupled simply means that one boundary is being shared by two domains. How do you know which one is being shared by which? You can look at the adjacent cell zone and that would tell you. And this is also important when post-processing values. For example, if you wanted to look at the fluid side temperature, then you would choose the boundary that is adjacent to the fluid zone. If you were to uh, look at the solid side results, then you would choose the boundary that is adjacent to the solid side. Right. We are not assigning any other boundary conditions on this coil because we already assumed that there's a volumetric heat flux um, heat source throughout the coil. So we're gonna go ahead and close the walls. And the rest of the walls also don't have any um, special boundary conditions. So you can see there's no additional heat flux, there's no other heat generation, uh, there's no wall thickness either, right? If you wanted to assign a temperature, for example, to any of these walls, you could have selected temperature and then varied the temperature. If you wanted to specify a heat flux in any of the additional boundaries, you could have done that over here as well. Now notice that I am not going to um, turn on the convection in this case. Why? Because we already have a fluid domain. I don't need to worry about the uh, fluid velocities in the vicinity. So I'm just going to go ahead and leave it at heat flux and close the dialog box. So this case has already been solved in the interest of time. Let me go ahead and show you some of the post-processing quantities that I got from here. So let me start with the coil temperature. So after this solution converged, I was able to look at the temperature distribution on the surface of the coil. What I was also able to look at was the temperature of the fluid on a cut plane. You will notice that as the fluid um, in the vicinity of the coil gets heated up, you can see a slight temperature variation. It's not much depending on the heat source that we've added, but there's definitely um, variation in the fluid temperatures in the domain, right? If you wanted to look at the temperature of the fluid at the outlet, you could go ahead and do that as well. Right. Now, how do you know that your simulation has converged? One, you could obviously, um, you know, assign some monitors and uh, wait until they steady out. In this case, I set up a drag monitor and an average temperature on the coil monitor, um, which steadied out uh, for me to assume that the solution has converged. The other thing that you can do is go to fluxes and look at the total heat transfer rate. Right. Now, remember that I um, assigned a three megawatt source in the copper coil. So this is roughly close to three, uh, depending on the volume that you assumed or calculated. Um, you know, this could, number could be a little off, um, but for all intents and purposes, uh, what we have to figure out is what is the net imbalance compared to the user source. So if you look at the net imbalance, it's only around 109 watts compared to three megawatts. So that's a very small percentage, um, which basically tells you that you have a pretty convert solution. Right. So these were some of the post-processing values that we found from this demonstration. Let me move on to the second demonstration that I wanted to show you, which go into the details of conduction a little bit. So let me go ahead and load that case. And while that case loads, I can take a look at one of the questions. What we have. 
do we need to assign any boundary condition as an interface between the coil and the water? So in this case, like I said, it was already conformal, so I did not need an interface. However, if I had separate meshes for the coil domain and the water domain, then yes, I would need interfaces uh, to ensure that the heat trend take place from the solid domain to the water domain or vice versa, depending on your boundary conditions. If you were to create interfaces, um, then they would basically uh, be listed over here under mesh interfaces. And I will be covering that example in the second part of this ABA series as well. Just give me one second. I'll drink some water before I start this case. So just a brief recap of this demonstration. We were talking about a heat source and a heat sink. We have a component, the black part at the very bottom, which will act as our heat source. And these aluminum pin fins on the top will act as our heat sink. There's also a copper plate in between. And in this demonstration example, what I want to showcase is how uh, we can set up different options for including conduction and thermal resistance in our simulation. Now notice that there is no fluid domain in this problem. It's just solid, right? There is no um, encompassing ambient atmosphere. We just have three different solids that you can see on your screen, right? So because you know there are three different solids with different materials and different properties, um, after turning on the energy equation, uh, we need to make sure that we have all the right materials included in our um, material list. So we have the aluminum pin fins, um, we have the copper plate, and we have a custom material which we're calling component, wherein I have assigned my own density, my own specific heat and conductivity, right? Which is the very bottom piece in black that you see. Now there is another material that you see in the solid list. It's called grease. Now this is not from the Fluent database. This is again a custom material that I um, included in this simulation. Um, why did I do that? Uh, oftentimes when you're working with real world applications, the contact between two overlapping metal components or you know solid components may not be perfect, right? There might be an air gap in between. There might be you know, some other material or a buildup. In this case, I'm assuming that there's a grease buildup uh, between my uh, bottom plate, which is the component plate and the copper plate. Now, how do I include that grease in my simulation without actually modeling it, right? I can assume a thickness for it, but I don't want to actually go ahead and you know mesh something that is so small because that layer of grease might only be like you know uh, micrometers in thickness. So how do I you know model that in my simulation and then account for a mesh that is so small without running into uh, you know computational issues, convergence issues? So in that case, Fluent gives you an option to include that as a virtual layer that I will depict when showing you the boundary conditions on the wall, okay? Of course, there's no fluid in the domain, so we don't have any, I mean, we do have air, but we don't have a fluid domain as such. If I click on these cell zone conditions, you'll notice that we only have solid. So I think for this, there was a 1.5 watt heat source that we were adding at the very bottom component. So we will go ahead and click on the solid heater. Let me ensure that this is the same. Yes, so this is the same domain that I'm talking about. This is at the very bottom. This is our heat source. Again, like the previous example, we have turned on the source terms. If I go to the source term tab and click on edit, you will notice that I've again assumed a volumetric heat source by dividing the overall heat with the volume of the domain. I'll go ahead and close this. The heat sink is the aluminum fin. There is no source for it. So we don't have anything ticked in and the material is aluminum. 
and then there's a plate in between which is made out of copper again it doesn't have any source terms right now we have some internal walls which we don't need to worry about um, and let us look at the walls. Again, you will notice that some of them are coupled walls wherein you have shadow walls that automatically form. So this answers the question that was raised a little bit earlier. When you already have a coupled wall in your simulation, then you don't need to worry about interfaces. Unless, you know, there's, you know, a region which has a non-conformal mesh uh, that you would be able to find out about if you do um, a check mesh or, you know, if you see in your results that heat transfer is not taking place, right? So in this case, let us look at all these uh, wall boundary conditions one by one. So the fin walls are the walls that are currently depicted in the graphic window. If I click on it and go to the thermal tab, you will notice that I've assigned it a convection boundary condition. Now this is what I'm talking about. I don't have a fluid domain in this problem. I am assuming that this is surrounded by, you know, almost stagnant air in a normal setting wherein you don't have much movement. So I'm assuming a very low heat transfer coefficient of 10 watt per meter square Kelvin for free stream temperature and free stream conditions, right? Now this is an assumption. This may or may not be accurate. So we'll find out as we post process the results, how important um, is, you know, assuming this correctly or perhaps not working with assumptions and actually modeling the fluid domain to get more uh, reasonable results, right? So I'm gonna go ahead and close this because I don't have any other settings for other options. And then I'm gonna go ahead and display this part over here. So this wall heater plate is a boundary that's on the top of the bottom component, the heat source. If I click on it, you will notice that it is a coupled wall. Of course, why? Because it is sandwiched between two different solid domains. So when one boundary is being shared by two um, different uh, adjacent domains, then it becomes a coupled wall only if the mesh is conformal. Now what I did there, what I did here is a trick. I told you that I'm assuming that there's a grease layer between my heater plate and my copper plate. Now, I don't want to model the actual grease layer. So what I went ahead and did, I selected a material name of grease. I'm able to choose grease because it is included in the material list. And then I assign it a random thickness. I'm assuming that it's 0.1 millimeters, right? Now what this does, it it adds that extra thermal resistance that you would expect in a real world scenario from that extra layer of grease in your simulation. Right? Um, again, this will only be in the normal direction. This will not be in the planar direction like I talked about in one of my slides. Um, but still, this is a fair enough assumption to get slightly more accurate results uh, than not considering grease at all. Now you'll notice that whatever boundary conditions that you assign for a coupled wall, they automatically get carried over to the shadow wall as well. <coughs> so this will also display the additional layer of crease. Okay. And then you have your um, heat sink walls, which are again coupled. And you know, this has, this has grease on it. So if I go ahead and display this, this is going to be slightly on top of the plate where we just assumed grease. And again, you know, you have a thickness assigned to it and you have that virtual layer of grease being modeled. This is everything that is exposed to the ambient air, which we are not actually including in our model. But wherever, you know, we are assuming that this is going to be in contact with ambient air, we are assuming um, 10 watt per meter square Kelvin as the heat transfer coefficient. And since there is no fluid domain, you will notice that these don't have any shadow walls, right? Because these boundaries are only lining up with one domain, which is the solid domain. 
So had they been exposed to an actual fluid domain as well, then these would also be shadow walls. Right? So all of these have convection boundary conditions. So this case is also solved in the interest of saving time. Um, again, you know, I set up some monitors to ensure that the solution is converged uh, before I started with the simulation. And uh, let me go ahead and show you what we get from the post-processing results. So this is a temperature gradient on the entire block. Um, it looks colorful, but in reality, if you look at the legend, there's only a one degree difference between the minimum and maximum temperatures. I just set the range as such so that we can see the temperature variation right from the hot part to the cold part, uh, because the component um, doesn't really yield a lot of heat as far as the source goes. Uh, we don't see much of a variation. But what I want to draw your attention to is that notice that the temperature gradient is uniform throughout the entire domain and uh, the temperature and the uh, variation looks constant for almost all the fins. Now this is not realistic, right? Because of course, you know, in a real world situation when air is um, passing through this, um, you know, the different, there will be a difference between the fins inside and the fins outside. But we're not able to capture uh, that difference in the temperature gradient between the different fins because we're assuming a 10 watt per meter square Kelvin constant heat transfer coefficient for all the surfaces that are exposed, that are supposedly exposed to the ambient air. This might work for you in simple heat transfer problems, but if you wanted to set up something more realistic, something more accurate, then you would have to set up a fluid domain as well. So I'm gonna go ahead and move on to that third file that will basically demonstrate the same problem. And there is another question about, can you parametrize inputs in fluent like you can mechanical? Yes, you definitely can. You can parametrize everything uh, within the ANSYS environment um, using Workbench. You can set up, you know, material properties, uh, boundary conditions, everything as parameters. And I will be having a future session uh, that covers optimization and, you know, parametric study uh, using a CFD case. Hey, Singh, just to jump in real quick, uh, you, know, you know what a great takeaway uh, from this whole ABA session that you just had right now coming from the structural side? When, when I do, uh, when I do uh, heat transfer simulations, I have, to, I have to assume a convection coefficient uh, from literature or experimentation. And um, I, think this is, I think this is great because you're you're, you're pretty much, your simulation results are what's transferring that convection coefficient. Yes. And, um, I think that's, that's a great addition that Fluent has, that's a limitation on the FEA side. Exactly. I just thought I'd bring that up. Exactly, exactly. This is one of the um, you know, most accurate ways of getting your heat transfer coefficients when you actually model the fluid domain so that you don't have to worry about assuming these empirical uh, relations and assigning a constant heat transfer coefficient, which is exactly what we're going to be doing in this problem over here. This is essentially the same problem that we just saw, the, you know, uh, pin fins and the heat source. Uh, it looks a little bit different because in the interest of saving time and computational effort, I've used symmetry boundary condition um, and uh, basically used a quarter of the entire computational domain um, instead of you know, simulating the full thing. Um, those of you who are not familiar with the symmetry boundary condition, it's nothing, it's simply a boundary that you create to reduce your computational domain. There are no fluxes at this boundary. Uh, it's like, in, you know, invisible wall where you're basically cutting off, um, assuming that, you know, the rest of the domain will be a mirror image of the symmetry boundary. Okay, so there are no fluxes and no shear stresses it can be assumed almost like a slip wall instead of a no slip wall. 
The other thing that I want to point out is we're not really assigning any velocities here, okay? We are assuming that this is just a component that's kept in the room, right? Now, I don't have any inlets wherein, you know, I'm specifying a certain velocity for the air to flow around this component. This is a natural convection case wherein you don't have a fan, wherein you don't have an artificially imposed velocity. So when you don't have forced convection and you're only looking at natural convection, then you have to take into account gravity, right? Because what happens is that when hot air rises, it basically acts against gravity. And that happens because of buoyant forces. So in order to go against gravity, you need to make sure that gravity is included um, in your simulation. So I'm gonna go ahead and turn on gravity for this case, um, assign the acceleration in the negative Z direction and also specify that in the operating conditions in just a bit. But otherwise the domain is still the same. Um, it's simply, if I were to look at the fins, it's still the same, it's just one fourth of what you saw earlier, right? Um, like I said, there are no inlet conditions. What I do have are outlet conditions because you know we're simulating the fluid domain. So if I go ahead and display this, and then add this to the graphics, you'll notice that I am assigning an outlet boundary condition to show the um, envelope of air around the component. If I click on the outlet boundary condition, you will notice that it is at zero gauge pressure, essentially signifying the environment and normal room temperature, right? So I'm not assigning any velocities as such. And rest, everything is symmetry boundary condition. So all this is symmetry, meaning that along all these boundaries, you're expecting fluent to know that there'll be a mirror image of the same geometry um, against the surface, right? So we don't have to worry about the symmetry boundary condition. You can just go ahead and close this. Now, because we have a fluid domain, you will notice that now along with the solid domain, we also have a different fluid domain, right? I'm gonna go ahead and display that so that you see the subtraction of the solid fins from the overall fluid domain. I'll add this to the graphics as well so that nobody is confused. So whatever you see, the impression over here is where the solid domain has been subtracted, right? So in this case, now when I go to the fin boundary condition, and I look at the thermal boundary condition, I don't even have convection available to me. This is automatically coupled. Why? Because now the fin walls have two adjacent domains. One is the solid domain of the fin itself, and one is the fluid domain that's encompassing it, right? So there is no convection boundary condition. There is no place where I need to specify 10 watt per meter square Kelvin and a room temperature. Fluent is gonna calculate that for me once I run the simulation, right? Everything else is the same. The grease layer is the same. Uh, we wanted to keep everything else consistent. The only additional thing that we've added is the fluid domain, right? Again, this is all conformal. You can see there are a lot of shadow walls. Uh, so for example, if I look at the wall fin, uh, one of it is adjacent to the heat sink, which is a solid domain and the other one will be adjacent to the fluid domain. So you can see over here. The other thing that I wanted to mention, which I was going to forget, is specifying the operating conditions. Like I said, this is a gravity driven flow. Um, sorry, a buoyant flow. But gravity, of course, you know, comes into the picture uh, when you're looking at the um, force that is calculated to uh, basically uh, create that buoyancy. And uh, we have specified an operating density which should correspond with the density of the air at that particular temperature. And we've also turned on gravity here in this operating conditions box. This is very important when you're doing buoyant flows, not just in the case of thermal applications, but even otherwise, um, whenever you're turning on gravity, make sure that you're specifying the operating density correctly. Otherwise, you'll not be able to capture the head or the, um, uh, you know, buoyancy effects correctly. 
So this case is also solved. Um, we're almost running out of time here. So let me just quickly go ahead and show you the difference between these results and the last results. So do you see how the temperature gradient now changes from the fins that are towards the outer periphery to the inner periphery? In the earlier case, everything was the same. All the fins looked the same because everywhere we had the same heat transfer coefficient. But when you actually model the fluid domain, now you can see how the you know, fins towards the middle uh, will be a little bit more less exposed um, to the ambient air, which is why they'll be considerably hotter um, than the fins on the outside. Now, of course, the temperature difference again isn't much. It's just two degrees instead of one degrees in the earlier case, but this definitely seems to be a more reasonable uh, result. We can also plot the heat transfer coefficient on these walls. So you can see how the heat transfer coefficient is actually different for most of the cases, you know, it's somewhere in the green range. So it's somewhere around um, 23 to 28 we were assuming 10 watt per meter square Kelvin. So we were quite off. And then there are some cases where, you know, you have even, you have, you know, like um, 57 watt per meter square Kelvin, right? It's a very small place, but I'm just saying that if you were to do an accurate simulation, and if you were actually looking at heat transfer coefficients, um, then this is how you would do it. Now, right now, you are only looking at a profile. What if you wanted to export this heat transfer coefficient profile and, you know, import it somewhere else for perhaps doing a coupled analysis? You could do a coupled analysis directly in Workbench. We will be covering that in a future session. But if you were to simply export out the profile, you could go ahead and do that as well. Simply go to the physics tab over here, right, um, and click on profiles and uh, click on write and choose what profile you want to export. So you could do the Nusselt number, you could do the surface heat transfer coefficient, you could do the heat flux. So I'm gonna go ahead and select heat transfer coefficient. I can choose wall fins and then write it out. The moment I select this, this becomes active. I'm not gonna write it right now, but uh, you get the picture, right? And if you were to look at the total heat transfer, um, again, you could do that as well. But before I do that, let me really quick show you this plume as well. So, you know, this was the um, outlet. Uh, these surfaces were defined as the, uh, sorry, not the outlet, but the symmetry. And you can see that because of the natural convection and the buoyant forces, there's definitely some heat transfer um, in the upward region. And you can see that in the temperature boundary conditions. Right. And um, if you wanted to look at the energy imbalance, again, you know, uh, you could simply choose the outlets and the walls. There's no heat flux on the symmetry, so I don't need to worry about that. You will notice that it's a very good convert solution with imbalance in the order of 10 raised to our, e raised to our minus 10. So uh, this is really good. And if I were to look at, uh, sorry, I'm looking at the total heat transfer rate. So you can see that the total heat transfer uh, is almost 0 0.375. Now this is one quarter of 1.5. So because we used a quarter of the geometry, that's why you know it's showing only quarter of the heat source. Um, but again, it's all volumetric, so it adds up to be the same thing. So you can see you know how easy it is to you know solve a heat transfer problem in fluent. I didn't do anything you know spectacular. It was not rocket science, but we got some very useful, commonly needed results that we can benefit from in our day-to-day -day applications. So with that, you know, I'm going to finish my demonstration. I'm going to go ahead and share my presentation again. And uh, go to the takeaway slide. So in today's AVA session, we first of all learn how to set up a heat source for a solid domain. You could also do that for a fluid domain. 
Um, we understood how to assign the inlet, outlet, and boundary conditions for walls, especially in the case of conduction and convection. Um, we were able to assign an, a virtual layer of grease in one of our demonstrations to add that extra thermal resistance. And also we learned how to post-process different quantities of interest, such as temperature and heat transfer coefficients. So with that said, I am open to taking any questions that you may have. Please feel free to leave them in the Q&A box. And we have two more questions in the Q&A box. One is, you know, is it required that the solution should be converged? Uh, yes, when you're usually doing CFD simulations, be it any kind of simulation, you want to make sure that you have a converged solution. A converged solution is not always the most accurate solutions. A simulation can converge to incorrect results as well. Uh, but definitely if your solution is not converged, then it will be incorrect, right? Because when I say converged, what I mean is that the quantities are not changing anymore with successive iterations. That's when you know that, you know, you've um, basically come to a point where in your domain setup, where in your mesh, where in your iterative process is not giving you different answers with each different step. So that's what I mean when I say, you know, you want to convert solution. Uh, that would uh, be the most accurate one. You can stop your simulation in between to look at intermediate runs to figure out how your simulation is progressing. But in order to rely on results, make sure that your solution is converged. Does a message show when it's converged? So let me uh, show you real quick. So when I said that I've set up some um, uh, monitors, that's what I mean. So whenever you set up monitors, for example, here I have, I'm looking at the shear stress on the fins. Uh, these will be plotted along with the simulation run. So when this graph steadies out and it doesn't change anymore with iteration, that's when you know that your quantity is not changing anymore and you probably have a convert solution. Another way of checking your convert, if your solution is converged or not, is basically looking at these fluxes tab. If you were to simply do a you know, flow simulation without taking into account thermal boundary conditions, um, then you could just simply look at the mass flow rate between the inlet and outlet. If it has like, you know, so you, we usually use at least, um, you know, one to 10% of normalized flow at the inlet. If if the difference between the inlet and outlet is more than that, then your solution is not converged. Something is off, right? And the other thing that you do is, you know, set up residuals. So residuals basically show you what level of convergence you're getting after uh, iteratively solving your flow and momentum and energy equations, right? So you can determine what level of convergence you want. For this is a, this was a demonstration case, so you know I simply worked with one e minus three, but an acceptable standard is one e minus six. When you say one e minus six, what you're basically saying is that the difference between nth iteration and nth plus one iteration should be less than one e minus six. If it is not, then my solution is not converged yet. So hopefully that answers the question, and. Uh, in future, please do flow simulation and open channels. Thank you, Mohammed. I will definitely take that into consideration. Open channels is a very commonly seen application. So for sure, I'd love to do something of that sort. There is nothing in the mesh interface of the tree anymore. There is nothing in the mesh interface because this was already a conformal mesh right from the pre-processing stage. If the mesh for the fluid domain and solid domain were assembled together, and then in design modeler, you had a contact region, that's when you, know, you would need to create uh, an interface manually, or it gets created automatically when it gets imported into Fluent. But because right now I meshed everything from scratch, the mesh was already conformal. That is why I did not need an interface. We had to set the couple surfaces one by one. Yes, that can be possible. If you are assembling a mesh, suppose you had a fluid domain and a solid domain, and you know you were setting it up in um, design modeler, you would assign the contact region uh, for each of those zones that are being shared by two domains. And then when it would be imported in Fluent, uh, either it would automatically be interfaced or you would have to do it. 
manually. So I am going to cover that in a future ABA session for sure. So I think I've answered all the questions. Um, but if there are any more questions or suggestions or something that you want to see in the future, uh, please let me know. I know I did not cover a lot from radiation, uh, but because you know that's a whole different ball game altogether, uh, I will be covering that sometime in the future. I don't know, you know, how in depth I can go, but um, we can definitely cover some uh, useful applications for that. And with that, I think our time is up. Um, I will. Uh, say goodbye for now, but um, stay in tune for next to next week's session. JD, I'm really excited. Thanks, Nigda. Thank you, everybody. Thank you so much. Bye-bye.